Pike fishing time! Woo! Roll that intro! Well, first session pike fishing of 2022-23 and it is pissing with rain. The rain is really battering down. So it's a cracking test of my new brolly. I'm, I'm fishing kind of on a hard standing here so there isn't anywhere I can drive pegs in. So it's kind of been held down by the tension strap and my chair. I've looked at the weather forecast. The weather forecast today is for showers on and off. Can't do shit about the showers. But it gives it to be not that windy, so... Fingers crossed and touching wood, we should be okay that the bivvy brolly won't blow away. There's enough weight in the tension and strap with my chair and my 20-something stone ass sat on top of it. I think we should be okay. I have three rods in, I have a, a mackerel tail to my left, it's sitting just before you come to a big ball of weed. I then have a pollen to my right and the skimmer bream in the middle. I am also wearing my new fox uh, salopettes and jacket. This is this is to replace the ProLogic one. Uh, I, tend, I, have two, I have a couple of sets of winter clothing. Because it's still relatively warm, there ain't no point putting on thermal gear. Because it will sweat the balls of you. And eventually you just get wet. So this type of, a, this type of wet weather gear is designed to wick the water away dead quick. But it isn't thermal, it's just basically a layer. Um, underneath that there you obviously, underneath this I'm wearing a pair of jogging bottoms and a pair of boxer shorts. There's no need for long johns, there's no need for 16 pairs of socks. So I'm warm, you know, on the top I'm wearing a t-shirt and hoodie. It's warm, I don't have to wear, you know, base layers at the minute. The good thing about layers, well, the way I look at it, you can put you can put more layers on to warm you up. If you're wearing like lots of layers, you can take them off to cool you down. If you're in a thermal setup, you can't really add or take it away. Now I do have a thermal uh, set of solid pets and jacket. I have the Nash Zero Tolerance stuff, and it is brilliant in the cold weather. But if you have to like do anything, like walk around or set stuff up, you are very, very warm. I've also had to purchase a new food bag. The I had a Fox Two Man Voyager cold bag thing. And I will do an in-depth review on it because it is terrible. It is fucking awful, pardon my language. So I've just went out and bought, a, it hasn't arrived yet, a extra large Corda Compact cool bag. It's basically just a cool bag for food. It's big enough for a day session. If I'm doing somewhere that I'm spending multiple nights, then I'll have to bring another bag. But for a day session, you don't want a monster of a bag, you, have, you just want a normal, I think the measurements on this thing is like a foot squared. It's big enough to hold your, your, loaf, your, your bread buns for your burger or for your bacon sandwich. It's big enough to hold your pint of milk and your, your ancillaries for your coffee. What more do you want? So when it arrives I'll do a bit of a review on it. The, also the good thing about that as well is on the inside of that there is uh, elasticated loops where you put cool blocks, you put cool blocks in the freezer so you can keep your beer extra cold 
that's if you were obviously going overnight. And you can hear the rain killing me. <laughs> But I quite fancy a cup of coffee, so I'm going to make that, and then we'll go through some bits and pieces. When the, hopefully the rain kind of breaks off a bit, so I can kind of go down and show you how I'm fishing. But until that, I'm having a coffee and a cigar. Oh, that's right. I have a couple of nice Cuban cigars. Not that I'm not going to smoke both of them today, but I might smoke one of them and have a cup of coffee. I've never actually tried this brand before. The Gantanamera. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. And these are, again, they're two Gantanamera Cuban Havana cigars. They were a gift, so it would be rude not to smoke them. But it's the first session, first pike fishing session of the year. Still relatively warm, but I couldn't wait any longer, so let's get stuck into it. This is how uh, wet it is at the minute. It's just stopped raining for the second, but this is how wet it is. I have a stream running through my, my uh, running through where I'm fishing. It was bone dry this morning. <laughs> Jesus, where did that rain come from? One fish, or rather, one small jack. Literally, the jack was about this big. It was about, if it was a foot long, it was lucky. And it managed to unhook itself before it got into the landing net. Luckiest pike in the world. It could have been a bit. The rain is still pretty coming down, br pretty brutal. I'm getting a, a good test of my, my waterproof clothing and my uh, brolly, that's for sure. The good thing about it being pike fishing, I can do some cooking. I'm not going to show you cooking today. Cooking with scobes is going to be dead simple. It's going to be me cooking some squared sausage and putting it into a bun. I'm a bit poorly organized. Let me just shake this rain off. I'm a bit poorly organized because my food bag that I use. I lost the page with it all together and you know every year once you finish with the arm we'll finish with the pike fishing. Like things like plates and you know dishcloths and spare sponges. Take all of them out of your cool bag out of your cooking bag or your food bag. Give your plates a good wash. Now I use metal enamel plates. You can't really go wrong with them. They're like hard pressed metal and then they're, they're given a coating of like some sort of enamel. They're pretty good, they stand up to the abuse. I've had them for years. But as I was putting everything back into the, the, uh, the food bag, as I call it, the weight of the, they're just literally, it's, it's two plates, it's a bowl, it's a little thing of salt and a packet of knives, forks and spoons and some sponges. Like to clean, clean, obviously clean your dishes when you're finished. And I sat it, closed the lid on it, and literally the whole thing just kind of compressed. Now that annoys me, you know. If forks are going to make something, at least make it strong enough so that when you close the lid, the lid doesn't squish the shit out of everything else that's underneath it. The only reason I had to replace the the plates and the cups, like I use Ridge Monkey cups, is because Fox give you ceramic mugs 
and they get smashed dead quickly from little things like falling over when you go to get a run they get chipped, they get smashed so plastic is the way to go for your coffee cup thermal plastic mug brilliant, keeps your coffee warm It'd be nice if you when you because that wasn't cheap, that was that was fucking expensive buying that thing. So I'll do like a, a long term review and it'll be a thumbs down review about that there. So I don't feel like I'm organized, my van's a mess, everything's in a mess, it's pissing with rain. But I've got three rods out and I've got a cup of hot coffee in my hand and I'm about to have a cigar. So life isn't all bad. Come on, pike gods. Let's be having something special. Cooking with scopes time! Yay! Because I'm a fucking idiot and I forgot to buy oil, my squared sausage is going to be cooked without oil. This is going to be interesting. Before I get here, from you, Japanese types, squared sausage, the best squared sausage in the world. Well, maybe not the best, but it's definitely up there. Comes from my local butchers. Squared sausage. It's rare that you see a butcher wrapping stuff in butcher paper these days, but it's all good. And they are going to go on to a brioche bun. <sighs> because these are sausage and sausage, it's pork, basically it's pork sausage. There's quite a lot of fat in them anyway. So I'm hoping that the, the pork will render down, the fat will come out. And that'll work. At least that's what I'm hoping anyway. Normally I have oil, a little bit of oil would have made this a little bit better, but because I've not had a chance to stock up. So this is cooking with Scobes, first session of the year, squared sausage. Lovely. The sausage has been lovingly cooked. Crawley crawling up my butt, my, my bivvy, Crawley. I'm gonna get mixed up with that for a while. Shelter. Oh. Now for brioche bread. The marriage of brioche bread and sausage. Squared sausage. If 
fact, I remembered my brown sauce. This would have been the best squared sausage I've ever eaten today. Just a bit wet today, but we're being treated to uh, the bells, the Quasimodo. The bells, the bells. Just sat and watched two little red squirrels. They were definitely the, the same sort of. They're very young. You can tell they're young because they're small. Like red squirrels are smaller than the greys. Anyway. This part of Fermanagh has a lot of red squirrels, which is great because they're the native ones. The greys are the uh, the American squirrel there, the in, in, the the invasive one. Um, grey squirrels, you have there's no there's no sort of bag limit to shoot them. You can just shoot as many as you want, and do so please because it helps the 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 population of reds and reds are the native ones, and this is, we want to keep their numbers high, but. They were scooting up a, a, a an acorn tree that's behind me, and then obviously kind of wrestling and running away, and running away with the acorns. And I'm not sure if this camera's picking this up, but one of them came literally running past my feet, looked up, seen me, and squawked, and then spat that out of its mouth and <laughs> ran that way. Cute little things. So there we go. A lucky acorn. Well, an acorn. Don't know if it's lucky or not. It's been a good day for the old wildlife. Um, on the way here, um, I had a couple of deer in the road. I'll show you that video now. On the road to go fishing, and I have some friends. I'm not going to try and spook them. I just want them to get off the fucking road without kicking my van. On you go. On you go. See the they're that fucking skittish. You you kind of don't have to, you don't want to pass them because they'll fucking run out in front of you. Right, there's a hole in the hedge. Get into the hole in the hedge. Get into the hole in the hedge. Unfortunately, we're young deer, and those were very very young deer. They're so skittish. If you drive past them. You know, they, they do stupid things like they could like run literally in front of your van and get knocked down. But if you sit there, they're that scared of you, they won't move because in their mind if they're not moving they can't be seen. Which is a pretty shit strategy. So you kinda as I kinda drove the van, they kinda run along the road a bit, found a hole in the hedge and well one of them found a hole in the hedge. The other one tried to jump through a fucking farm gate. So it's been a it's been a good day for the wildlife. It's always good. To, I quite like the little red squirrels. You know, it's nice to see nature. It'd be nice to see a couple of pike in my my unhooking mat, but I've had nothing apart from that little jack that I shook off or got shook off at the net. It's my favourite time of the year, autumn. You know, with the, just the beautiful colours and stuff like that there. This place, if you're ever stressed or pissed off or, you know, feeling a bit down, your mental health wouldn't be that good, get outdoors. <clears throat> get away from other people. Just get out into the wild. There's something about it that kind of, uh, well, I don't know, there's something about it that kind of, you know, it, kind of, it always kind of helps me. You know, so that's my top tip for the day. Get outside, get into the wild. You don't have to like go a million miles. I mean, even if it's a, a walk around the forest or something like that. You know, we're very blessed in this part of the world to have the scenery that we have. So, it would be nice to use, take, adv take advantage of the scenery that we have. You know, you could live in some inner city shithole. You know, 
so when you do get the chance to come out to the wilderness, it's pretty good. Not that I live in an inner city shit hole, I mean the, the place where I live is pretty chilled. You know, for those of you that don't know, I live in uh, a town called Oma in the west of Northern Ireland. Where it's a nice town. Well, how is it? I've got a proper collection of arseholes, but every town has those. It's just nice to get away. So what's been happening this week in the news? Well, I say Liz Truss was the the shortest Prime Minister we've ever had in the UK. The writing was on the wall for the uh, for the lady when she put one of the most detestable pricks in the world as her uh, chancellor after she sacked the first one that she picked. So it looks like Boris Johnson's coming back. Politics. <laughs> I can imagine the uh, the people's faces when old Bojo turns up to be number ten again. I can remember I can just imagine him walking into Ten Downing Street and saying, "Motherfucker, the woman moved my furniture around." <laughs> Might have a change up a bit. I have a brooch on one. I did have a mackerel tail on that rod. That's the rod that had the jack. And you know, as sort of as sort of like, like sawage law, literally that jack would have been ten to twelve inches. It was tiny. I'm not even sure if it was hooked. Because when I went to kind of slip the net under it, the hooks kind of pulled. Uh, so the fish managed to squeeze the, the mackerel tail into its mouth. And with the mackerel tail, I probably, the hooks just probably pulled from the mackerel tail. So at least the little fucker got fed, you know. Not if everything's a plus, you know. I was defrosting my bait freezer. I do that every year. I'll defrost the bait freezer. Take account of what I have and what stock I have and... You know, all that sort of stuff. What I need to order. And I found packets of uh, baits that I'd dyed and injected and popped up with stuff. I was experimenting for a while with uh, pop-up sticks. The carp anglers have boilies that are pop-up material that'll, that'll float up. So I made some of those into like... Uh, like the thickness of a pencil and got the, the fish and then started to put the pop-up stuff down into their stomachs and it was like a case of like an experiment it literally, it literally was sitting in my back garden with a bucket you know and thinking this is the size of the bait it takes two four inch pop-up sticks to make it to make it kind of you know buoyant and then you stick a trace in it so that it's got the weight of the hooks I like my baits so that they're they're not, you know, straight at like super super mega buoyant, that they'll just have a nice slow rise. I find that there in moving water or you know if the bait's kind of off the ground and it's just kinda of wafting, you know you know, it's kinda of not neutral buoyancy, but it's it is buoyant, but it's just not mega filled with buoyancy. And the thing is if the pike eat them, it's I mean literally it's a boily. You know, it, it, it's like, was it semolina flour, egg, and that's about it, really? You know, you could add cork dust. I try to think of uh, pop-ups for stuff, like if the pike manages to swallow the bit, will it be able to digest the bit? And with the pop-up boily sticks, 
yeah, they probably will. They'll be able to digest it and, you know, crap it out and everything will be cool. It's like when I use the, the wooden dowel rods, I always make sure that they're tied to the trace so that the fish, you know, if I, if I lose a bit, I've just lost a bit, I haven't lost the, the pop-up rod because I don't want the pike eating those because it's a it's a balsa dowel, you know, that's not something you'd like to try and crap out yourself. It's been a strange day. You have periods where it's lovely like this, where it's nice and calm and you know, it's not raining. And then you'll have periods where literally the rain is thundering down, hammering down. You know, to the point where I've got like a small river running between my, the legs of my chair. Had a dropped run on the on the uh, pollen. The pollen came back in and it's all chewed up. So I've just quickly slung it back out to where it was, hoping that the thing will come back. But it shows me that there's fish in the area. This is good. I got asked a few times about uh, my running ledger setup for Pike. Uh, I'm going to show you a diagram of that, like a picture. And you can freeze the, the pause the video. And it'll show you my running ledger setup. I'm going to show you that now. But I'm going to talk to you as well about the importance of having a heavy enough lead. I'm not asking people, I'm not, you know, you don't have to go out and chuck uh, beach casting leads, you know. But you have to have a heavy enough anchor point to make your rig work. Basically, you want the lead that is heavy enough to hold the bottom if there's a, if there's a current or if you're fishing at a bit of distance, you want that lead to be heavy enough to anchor your bait down. Now, when I'm fishing like a running ledger, yes, you can clip the lead direct to the to your run ring. There's no problem with that until your lead gets snagged behind a rock or something. Then you have to, you know, pull for the break. But you gotta kind of look what's going to break first. I mean, you've got mainline. Maybe it's like my mainline at the minute. That's that's fifty-five pound braid. So I'm. <laughs> it's going to be a bit of a pull, you know. So this is why I use a length of monofilament from my run ring to my lead. Doesn't have to be a massive length. Now this is going to be near impossible to see with the with this bloody camera, but I'm going to try and give it a go here. Here is my lead. This is just a simple loop. Simple loop because you want to get your lead off. So you would have a loop big enough to slide your lead on and a loop big enough to take your lead off. So there we have it, simple loop. And up that line, I have like three or four granny knots. This is like a 12 pound monofilament. It's old 12 pound line. Um, if the lead's stuck and I have to pull for a break, then the 55 pound braid won't break, but this 12 pound line will break. This is what's called a rotten bottom. This will break. Um, when you add knots in it, it reduces the, the strength of the, of the rotten bottom drastically. So having three or four knots in it, well this one has three, three. Four if you include the knot of the loop. It gives you enough strength to cast with the lead. Now again, this is, this is, a, this is a five ounce lead. So this is quite a heavier lead, this is quite a heavy lead. Again, there's no real current here, there's no real flow here. You wouldn't really need to use a lead that heavy. 
for this previous minute, at the minute I've got like three ounce leads on, that's perfect. I'm not fishing a million miles away, I'm just fishing, you know, short chuck. So a three ounce lead, brilliant, holds the bottom. It means I can tighten my, my, my reels down so that I'm getting a straightforward tight bowstring connection from the lead to my drop arm. You don't want slack lines. The drop arm sh should be heavy enough. If there is a slack line, the drop arm will start to fall because it's pulling the slack out of the line. You don't want slack. Get off of my bivy, you big dirty bug. You don't want slack lines. So you want it to be tight. When the pike picks up your bait, you want it to register on your drop arm. The little jack that threw, threw the hook or got off this morning, uh, it didn't physically pull the drop arm out. I was down at the rods and the tip of the rod just started going like that there and I thought, okay, that's something that's on my rod. And I stood and I watched it for a couple of minutes and it was still giving it dink like that there. I thought, okay, I'm going to wind into this. I didn't strike, didn't set the hooks, I picked up, and as I lifted the rod, I could feel like the little taps. I initially thought this is the taps of something small, like a trout. You know, so I wound in, of course, my own fault, I should have really set a hook. But then again, if I had set the hooks, I'd have probably ripped the hooks clean out of the bait. I'm not even sure that pike was hooked, but anyway. It got a free lunch. So this is why I use, uh, it would be about what, two feet, three feet of old 12 pound or you know, line. You, you basically want your lead link to be lighter than your main line. Now if you're using braid, that's never gonna be an issue. You know, the, the lightest braid that I would ever use would be 55 pound. That's the lightest I would go bait fishing for pike. Uh, I've got braid that steps right up to 100 pound. Uh, you know, that's for like longer range, you know, fishing where I have to kind of might have to be somewhere snaggy and I have to pull you know pull hook straight. But that's, that's that's what it is, you know. It's the same with monofilament. I wouldn't use I would use monofilament thickness, uh, like not point fours. That's about you can be you can get I mean, there's some the suffix like lines. That's like 20 to 30 pound brick and strain, not 0.4 millimeter. So I would use that if I was using a monofilament. I think with pike angling, you you don't have to be don't don't be scared to kind of go a bit heavier. At the end of the day, when you're pike fishing, you should aim that every single thing you cast out, you bring back. That is your mission, you know. You're not aiming to cast stuff out and leave it lying on the on the bottom, uh, or you shouldn't be. If you if that's your attitude, don't go don't go pike fishing. You know. But that's my rotten bottom lead link setup, and this this sort of thing's been it's used by like loads of different pike anglers. I mean, I know in Mick Brown's book, the the the, the passion and the practice, the practice and the passion. The very first Mick Brown book I ever read, he did the same thing, you know, he used the same sort of thing. So that's, you know, it's, it's been around, it's been tried and tested, it's, it works. So, pike fishing, the good thing about pike fishing is you don't have to reinvent the bloody wheel, you just stick with what works. You know, it's, it's not like carp angling where you have to have, like, the new Gucci rig of the week, you know. With like sw spinning swivels and and <laughs> and twenty five bits of fucking line for your hook length, all tied in special knots to 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 fill an animal that at the end of the day eats dirt and shit off the floor of the fishery. You know, I laugh. I really do laugh. Every carp angler's his friends. You know, and one of them was talking about putting. Uh, it was complaining about how much Himalayan rock salt has went up in price, and I'm the guy going, "Why the, why the, why would you be using something that's that expensive? What's wrong with normal sea salt?" And he was adamant, "No, no, the carp in his fishery or where he fishes 
only will come to the baits if they have the finest of Himalayan rock salt on the boilies. And I'm the guy going, you realise that carp eat worms and casters and uh, basically if they can fit it in their mouth they'll eat it. You know, snails, the stuff that stuff that you wouldn't you couldn't pay me to eat, carp will eat quite happily. But there's this guy out there thinking he's Gordon Ramsay or the the boily Gordon Ramsay. Trying to <laughs> trying to fucking get himself that he has to spend a fortune on putting Himalayan rock salt rock salt on a sweet corn. <laughs> like it's like come on man. You don't have to do that. Oh. Oh, that is also right. I went on a speaker's day. I wasn't speaking, I was sat listening. Uh, pike angling legend Dave Horton came across to uh, Northern Ireland for the Northern Ireland PA Pike Angling Club of Great Britain, Northern Ireland. That's the Northern Irish region of the PAC. And along came Dave Horton. Now, Dave's been one of my uh, angling inspirations for a long time. Uh, I've read his book, you know, I've talked to him on social media or on the various forums, and he, he's a good guy. You know, he's a he's a funny guy. He he will openly admit that there's times in his in his pike angling career, you know, where he would go that extra step and bend a few rules to uh, to catch a few fish, and that's got to be you know. I I, can, I think that's respectable. I can recommend that. You know, he, he's shown some of the pictures of the pike that he's caught. You know, thirty pounder pike that's fish of a lifetime for most of us, and this man's caught them. You know, you know he, he's had some serious amounts of fish. So it was nice to kind of meet the guy and listen to his talk and you know see his slideshow. It was also nice to kind of meet up with. Um, the, the, the region, the Pike Angling Club region for Northern Ireland, uh, put some faces to names. You know, I'm not going to push anybody out there that's, that's uh, you know, that doesn't want to join a club to join a club. But if you're looking to start off Pike Angling and you don't quite know where to go, um, your local PAC would be as good a place as any to start. The, you, the guaranteed you have a bunch of friendly guys there that'll They'll quite happily show you the ropes and help you out. Um, that's the same. There's, there's like branches all over England and Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, if you live somewhere like the Republic of Ireland, then you have what's called the Irish Pike Society, uh, run by Ian Ford. A good guy, you know. Those guys are in the trenches, you know, kind of looking to protect the interests of of, uh, of Irish pike fishing against what is. Um, insanity from the, the the trout angling lobby on places like Corrib. Um Those guys really are, you know, doing doing cracking work. Again, if you're in Scotland and you don't fancy joining the the Pike Angling Club of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, there is another association called the Pass uh, Pike Angling Alliance of Scotland. Again, good bunch of guys. They'll help you out if you need help. They'll. Give you direction with like things like the mechanics, like the rigs and stuff. You know, this is part of the reason why I started doing this channel, uh, so that it's not just me talking shit and having a laugh. You know, it's if some if you can get something out of it, if you can get uh, you know a laugh out of it as well as kind of walking away going, oh, that's quite an interesting way that that rig works. So I might try that. Then it's great, you know, that's what I'm doing it for. And I do believe we have some sunshine. Oh my god! We have sunshine! I'll not say it out too loud in case the weather gods hear me and start to whack it down with rain again. We had sunshine for about four minutes. And then a dirty big black cloud is just about to roll over and dump a ton of rain. So, I have the baits out that I have out. Red roach on the bottom, 
full of, uh, I think it was sardine, Eddie Turner sardine oil. In the middle it is a popped up skimmer bream that has been, I don't know if I put oil in it, and it's a popped up skimmer bream. And on the, the third rod it's a pollen. It's the same pollen, I don't know if it's popped up because it's got chewed so it might not be popped up no more but it's out there. My mate, the squirrels are back. They're just over there. Every time I go to get a fucking photograph for the phone, the little shit moves. So I've kind of given up trying to get a photograph of them. Every now and then, I'll see one of them jumping out the tree to wrestle with the other, and then it's gone. Gotta love the wildlife. Very impressed with this brolly, by the way. I'm currently wearing the Fox Aquios Tri Lair Salopets. They're actually pretty good. Pockets. You've got two pockets. Not that pockets are anything to be special about. It's a single layer material. Seams are welded, seams are taped. Decent zips. Decent zips. This is the uh, the big boy version. Again. Pretty good. It will keep you dry. If I can find the. On the inside, you have two big pockets. A small stash pocket, I guess, for a phone. Yeah, pretty good. The sleeves have got this, uh, like the, so they've got like a layer that kind of, well, I thought it would, I thought it did, it did come with something that you put your thumb through, but I don't think it does. The last jacket I had had this sort of material, but you had, you could put your thumb through it, so when you were getting it on, you, It's uh, comfortable, keeps you dry, obviously you're going to wear this like over top of layers, you know, you're not going to wear this in the middle of winter with just a t-shirt on because it's not going to keep you warm, um, yeah, pretty good. Now obviously this won't, you know, this isn't something that you would wear, you know, if it was really, really cold, you would wear a thermal one. This is probably a better view of the, the inside of it, where you can see that it's all been uh, taped, all the seams are taped. It's lightweight, it'll keep you dry. This is the full length jacket, you get like a three quarter length one. I opted for the full length one. Decent quality zips. There. 
Aquios trial air, Fox Aquios trial air. I thought I'd treat myself to something new to wear. It's amazing the shit that you find when it gets when you pull in a ball of line and stuff. Anyways, let's get a bit in the water. Oh, can't show you that. That's the secret one. This is why I like having having uh, a few traces made up. In fact, that one's not going to do. AFW bleeding leader wire, ball bearing swivels, tressless 24 inches long. Bits have been in that box all day, they're still frozen. Right, here is how I rig up my bait. Nice and simple, that's a half a mackerel, it's been dyed red, and it's a half a mackerel. Cut the tail off, because all that does is spin when you're throwing it out. When it's in the water, it'll just spin. Cause twists, don't want twists. You just want a nice lump of fish like that. Can you still see me?
the weed still quite still quite fresh, not dead yet. So when you're bringing your bits back in, they'll look like this. This is no good. What we need is a good fortnight. At least a good fortnight of temperatures down to single digits, preferably closer to zero the better. These were some of the the dyed roaches. They're all popped up. And the, the dye kind of doesn't really, I'm not so sure how this picks it up, but the dye kind of uh, only, only sinks in a little bit for some reason. But that's still a good bit. I'll still use that. I get stick for hooking the, the roach that way, so that's head up the line. Now, there isn't much current, but it's going that way. So by hooking that head up the line, that's going to be sitting like this with a head. This is going to be the bottom. And this is going to be the roach. I'm just going to sit and do this, because this is buoyant. So it's going to sit and do this here in the in the water in the the water. So now you see why I hook it head up. This is again American fishing wire. Brilliant stuff. But the difference is this isn't the. That's not the. The red, the bleeding leader stuff, that's just normal surf strand or whatever it is with the, with the plastic coating. But that bit there, I suppose I could re dye it and freeze it again and put it back out next time. Give it a couple of hours, see what comes up, if anything. So, first day of the season, rain was brutal, one dropped run and one fish that could have been bit shook off at the net. It isn't so bad, it's actually cleared up and it's really nice now, you know, beautiful day, but the uh, first half of it was absolute murder, first half was chaos man, the rain just was... <laughs> I give my brolly a thorough testing, put it that way. I'm going to wind in. I'm going to drive home. I have work tomorrow and 6 o'clock comes around early, so... I'm going to go home, have something to eat, and plan the next adventure, I guess. I want to say thank you to everyone who's uh, liking, sharing, subscribing... Doing the um, the YouTube shit. Um, there's a Ko-Fi link in the box below the description. If you're insane and want to send me money for a pint. You don't have to. But it's there. I, all I would ask is you drop a thumbs up and uh, like the video. If you're feeling generous, share it out with your friends. That's about all I want, really. So, let's see where this winter goes. Let's sort this van out this week when I have a chance, because it's absolute chaos. 
but it's awesome to be out on the bank. So I'm going to wish you all tight lines and I hope you all have a good uh, winter. May your rods be bendy and your lines be tight. Tight lines guys.